Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're here to uh, uh, talk about uh, two of the topics that was proposed. Uh, how rockets work, and uh, basically uh, maybe talk about how life support works on the uh, for spacecraft. Uh, we have several gentlemen here who who have uh, been involved in the um, space industry to begin with. And uh, yesterday, when I, when I talked, I uh, I wasn't as aware as maybe I should have been as the online community. So if the online people have anything that they want talked about, uh, some of us here in the room. Uh, can answer some of those questions. Um, I, I know uh, you had uh, uh, wanted to know more about uh, specific impulse and orbital mechanics, so maybe we'll we'll uh, start with that a little bit. So, okay, okay. All right. What's your background? Uh, I uh, have been working for uh, Boeing for the past uh, seven years on the space shuttle program. I did uh, three and a half years working active thermal control and life support systems, and then uh, uh, last uh, three and a half years I've been uh, working entry aero heating. So, I talked a little bit yesterday about uh, re-entry uh, mechanics and that, and uh, so I kind of thought I'd talk about these other things a little bit. So. And how about yourself? I'm a futurist and an engineer, so okay. I help companies plan long-term strategies. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, so, so one of the questions was about a specific impulse, and um, I think r really... Um, or I guess if you look on, uh, as far as the definition of, of specific impulse, uh, I is equal to, uh, it comes down to the exhaust velocity of the rocket uh, times the uh, gravity constant. Uh, but this is just engineer speak for, you know, it, it all comes down I to... I think uh, it's divided by G. Divided by G? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think you're right. Yes. I was trying to explain it uh, at yeah. the table to somebody earlier, and I, <laughs> and I recall it. Okay. that out. <laughs> no, thank you. And, and if anybody at, online sense, has any corrections to what I'm, I'm throwing up here, yeah. but uh, the idea of a, is a rocket it is you're, ex, you're giving momentum to one thing, and that mo the conservation of momentum means that if you push something one way, you've got to go the other way. And so you're trying to, to uh, take these really small uh, fuel and oxidizer and, and uh, push it one direction at a really, really high speed to get the most amount of momentum because the, uh, the momentum is equal to um, uh, the mass we change use, times use, the exhaust use, velocity. In, in physics, we usually use P for momentum yeah, just to, so it doesn't get yeah. confused. Yeah. I realized as I wrote that down, I was using my own way. So P uh, equals mass times uh, the, the exit velocity. So to get the most momentum change, you, you want to dump a lot of fuel, and you want to dump it as fast as possible to get the most amount of P. Oh, <laughs> most amount of momentum. <laughs> in, a, in a physics class, you wouldn't have any problem with this. Yeah. Yeah. For general audience, you, 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 there, there might be some vocabulary right. uh, vagueness, shall we say. It, um, but, but really, um, what, what you're looking at here is, it, for specific impulse, it, its best analogy is uh, miles per gallon in a car. Is, uh, yeah, you you it, want a Prius in, instead of an SUV. Yeah. Uh, maybe I can help a little bit, because uh, I remember some of the history of this way back in ancient times. It was defined in English units, mm -hmm. and it was defined as the number of seconds, one pound of propellant, would pr or propellant combination would produce one pound of force. Okay. Oh, a, yeah, that's a, a good of thrust. Right. Of thrust. Uh, and so, obviously, the higher the exhaust velocity, well, the, the longer, the, the less propellant you have to pr ex ex exhaust at, per unit time to produce that pound of force. Right. So you get uh, more, uh, for a rocket that has to carry its own propellant, rather than a jet engine that can get some of its fuel from the air. You always like to have the highest exhaust velocity you can get it, can manage all other things being equal. Yep, correct. And, um, and, and as far as, um, the, to give ideas of, of, of performance on, on this uh, specific impulse, uh, the space shuttle is one of the, uh, the main engines is one of the, the most efficient rocket in, chemical rocket engines that has ever been built, and that number uh, just on a, on a 
the, the scale of seconds um, is 450. So if you're doing 450, that's really good. Now, um, it, they kind of go back to the, the uh, Prius versus SUV analogy. I mean, the, uh, the Prius is, it might, might give you really good gas mileage, but it doesn't have the kick that an SUV has. So now you got your solid rocket boosters that have a little bit, uh, they're less efficient. They, they've got an ISP maybe around uh, maybe 280 to uh, 320 range. I, I would have, I, I don't know the number offhand, but it's probably somewhere in this ballpark. But those solid rocket boosters have a lot of thrust. And, um, and that's the trade-off um, a lot with uh, specific impulse, is you might get something really efficient, but it's not gonna give you the same thrust per, per mass as, as yeah. something like this, yeah, a solid. It, 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 it result, that's a result from the trade-off of kinetic energy versus momentum. Right. Because the kinetic energy you get out of your propellant goes as mv squared, or one half mv squared, but the momentum just goes as mv. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, you, you're always playing that trade game. So right. it, it turns out that if you have a given energy supply and a given propellant combination, you're always trading high thrust versus high, high specific impulse. And it's really hard to get both of them high at the same time unless you have one humongous energy source like, say, nuclear power. Right, exactly. Yeah, a lot of people come out and say, hey, we got the, these cool ion engines, and they might have a specific impulse of, like, 3,000, some, something really high. Something, um, but you, the, the power, if it's, it's got this super low thrust. And so, um, I mean, when, we're, when they're talking about these ion engines on spacecraft, they're talking about a couple pounds of thrust. Uh, and that's taking a fair amount of energy to produce that thrust. So, yeah, if you were to scale this ion engine into something where you could try to launch something, vehicle from the ground, the amount of energy it takes is really uh, what constrains that problem. And you just can't produce enough energy on, a, on something like an ion engine to be able to, to get off the ground. Yeah, because way. their energy sources are either... Uh, currently, and, and with current technology, are either solar panels, which basically are limited by how much solar uh, radiation they can collect, and how much, how efficiently they can convert that into electrical energy. Right. Or uh, nuclear uh, isotope, radioisotope uh, power sources. They, you know, they're not nuclear reactors, they're nuclear radioisotopes, and while they produce a, f a fair amount of energy, they produce it as a, at a low rate, so the actual power output in terms of watts or kilowatts is somewhat limited. Yeah. I thought no. ion engines no. also only work in a vacuum. Um, it, that is a constraint. It, it is, yeah, if you, if you, if say maybe if you were trying to launch something off the surface of the moon, let's say, that, that would be where an ion engine uh, theoretically if, might be, if you be could, great. If but you, you could you get could enough energy it. to produce enough thrust. Yeah. If you, the other constraint on ion engines is the size of the grids they can build um, yeah. to accelerate the ions. They, yeah. they can't infinitely size well, we have some yeah, uh, New people come in, especially some young people, and maybe some of the younger young, uh, young folks might have some questions. Yeah. Is there anything you want to know about <laughs> life, how rockets, uh, rockets work? work or, or uh, life support or life anything? Sports? Orbital no. mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> He's blushing now. Okay. <laughs> it's all right. If you think of some questions later, feel free to chime in. Now, now one thing that um, to kind of give give an idea how how much that specific impulse it, uh, really drives the equation. Um, one of the things they talked about doing on the Saturn program, um, and I should have brought that Saturn V model in here, is uh, so you got your capsule on the top and. Uh, there was uh, three stages on the Saturn V. I mean, I actually and this is very the, 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 the second and third, first and second stages are actually the same diameter. Okay, yeah. Uh, it's a all right. So first, we'll do second, He's and an third, numbers. and payload up here. So, my third Saturn V. Um, so, so this stage down here, um, this this used uh, a, it was a hydrocarbon engine where basically it's using something similar to jet fuel and, and oxidizer and and like um, uh, Larry was mentioning earlier, 
your car engine, when you're burning fuel, uh, you don't have to worry about bringing in uh, oxygen for the fuel to burn. And so your, your car is a lot more efficient that way because if you had to carry a big old oxygen tank in the back of your car to make your engine run, it'd be a lot bigger. Uh, and that's why the rockets, they really got to carry, they got to carry both components. Um, and this first stage, um, like I said, they used hard hydrocarbon fuels. And the, and the reason for that is, is that the fuels were a lot more dense. Thank you. Hey. There we go. Hey, we were actually your actually yeah, she brought me one bottle. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so we had the hyd hydrocarbon stage, and um, it's a lot more dense uh, fuel. If you were to uh, try to make this into um, what they did for the second and third stage, which was liquid oxygen and uh, liquid hydrogen, this stage would have been much, much bigger um, to be able to take the, because liquid hydrogen is a lot less dense uh, than, um, than the hydrocarbon fuel. You, you would get more performance in one sense, but you'd also have more structural mass. And there's right. a, there's a yeah. trade off. And so you, yeah, you, you basically, when you're doing your design study, you try to figure out what's the best trade for the stuff you knew how to build at mm -hmm. that time. <laughs> right. And especially when this, when, I mean, the, the first part of the stack is flying mostly in the atmosphere. And so you really got to trade off is, you know, if, if you make this thing bigger, it's got to go through the atmosphere more. If you make volume isn't as much a concern on the higher stages because you're flying in, in vacuum and, and drag isn't an issue. Um, so so this, the, the performance on the hydrocarbons, again, are, they're probably similar to the, the solids around in the, in the 300 range. Um, and, and then uh, you go to the second stage here, which was now that we're flying higher, uh, we're doing um, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. This is this is close to the, uh, very efficient as you can get. And um, they the there was five engines on the second stage. Uh, they, they were called the J2. And this engine worked so well um, that they were actually going to reuse this same engine on the Constellation program. Um, so they, basically, they, they, they were, were going to tweak the design. They're, they're tweaking it, trying to get, get a little, little bit, bit out of it. Better performance. Yeah. They, they got what they what the performance they knew how to get in the 1960s. Out of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, it, it, as far as it, where it was started, it, it was a really good engine, and yeah, just getting a little bit more uh, more uh, uh, efficiency out of it um, was was the goal on on Constellation program. Um, and then uh, you have got your the the final stage here. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is again, it's it, they actually used just one of these same engines, uh, the, another J2X, and, and it too was uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Um, but all this system, um, you you deliver to the the lunar surface this one little uh, lunar lander module that's inside here, and I mean it, it's a really lightweight system. Um, but I mean we're, we're talking. Anyone know offhand how much lunar lander weighs? I don't have that. Yeah, yeah, a couple thousand pounds, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, Walls were now, very thin. In the 60s, they talked about replacing uh, this stage with a, a nuclear-powered uh, engine. Now, it's not nuclear like what you think, maybe like a, a missile explosion or anything, but the, they're using the energy, the nuclear energy and the material to heat up a working fluid, which, which was hydrogen. And uh, they actually built some sample stages of this back in the 60s. And basically, you just flow the hydrogen over this hot material. And that material has so much energy per mass that you could um, get the, er, these, the efficiency up to about 800 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Some quick research says 32,000 pounds for the lunar lander. That's the really? 3,200 no. is more 3,200. Yeah. That can't well, be right. I'm just or it, that might be um, maybe closer to what constellation was talking about. fuel. Uh, oh, really? Okay. okay. I, I, the empty weight, I think, was maybe may, may thirty-two hundred. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, you. Um, but but just by switching this one stage from about four hundred something seconds to eight hundred something seconds, you could have delivered roughly twice the mass to the lunar surface. And, and I mean, but the problem is, is okay. You've got a bunch of nuclear material next to chemical explosives, and these days they call that a dirty bomb. So, and, and terrorists make those. So well, it, that's the biggest hurdle in all this. There, there isn't a technological hurdle to doing something like this. It's just 
if there was an accident, you've suddenly taken tons of nuclear material and spread it over several hundred square miles out in the ocean, or worst case, over Florida. Actually, it's not tons, it's yeah. a few kilograms. Yeah. You don't, don't well, forget the energy density of uranium. That is, but I, well, I, I don't know how much, I mean, when they talk about like nuclear... For, for, the, for the Nerva engine, which I've seen test okay. articles of at, at Huntsville, Okay. It was like, uh, or, or, or mock-ups of test articles that they actually, t they did test it out in Nevada. In, in right. It was, it's a few kilograms of, of material. Basically, uh, if you put it together in the right way, you could make a bomb, a small bomb out right. of it. But you, right. You don't it, want more words, you're not, you're not going to have a nuclear explosion with this. It, it's, it's the, the issue is, is the fact that you're taking this radioactive material and just spreading it out into a large area. Yeah. So. And uh, I, I suspect that you could have designed the thing so that it was in a safe capsule and would not have would have survived yeah. the explosion. Yeah. I suspect oh, yeah. that would still be deemed a politically infeasible yeah. thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, we, we have. I mean, they, they talk about putting like a, few, a kilogram or something like that on on uh, some of these space probes. And it's it's a really dicey political issue as it's far as grams. margins. That's more like uh, okay, grams. grams. Okay, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. a few hundred grams typically yeah. now for for the really high end uh, models. But I, I my think is, the thing is we need to, somebody needs to stand up to the, the pseudoscientists and the flakes and tell them that they're pseudoscientists, scientists, scientists and flakes and 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 marginalize them as they deserve to be. <laughs> well, they're operating on a principle of, yeah. of probability of occurrence of the accident and on the other axis is the potential damage. I understand. And so even though the probability can be brought to virtually zero, yeah. Even if it, you can never get it to completely zero, the, the potential consequences are. Yeah, well, it's again, you can design the capsule to survive. Right. Well, I mean, no, yeah, no matter what, there's there's still some level of risk. It, it, I mean, it, it, every it, time you like, step on an airplane, I mean, yeah, you're, you're yeah. taking a calculated risk, even though that risk of getting on an airplane is actually more hazardous than driving to the airport. And this but, is, uh, <laughs> and politically, if it happens right. to blow up over somebody else's country. Yeah, yeah you, you, you got a uh, political hot point with that. I'd like to draw something up here. I'd oh, like yeah. to draw the uh, shuttle external tank. And uh, the reason is, you know, you talked a little bit about density. We're talking about these nuclear rockets, and I think this kind of plays in. Uh, the sh the, the, all that tank does, this is, a big, uh, this is the big orange tank you see uh, on the shuttle stack when it goes up. And uh, all it is is it's two tanks inside this, this outer shell. And you've got a, a tank up here, a about that big, maybe a little bigger. Little the, tank. That's the little tank. Yeah. Right. Well, of course, it's bigger than you know this room, but you know. It's a little tank. A, but a relatively, relatively, relatively size little. Object. Okay. And that that holds the oxidizer. That holds the liquid oxygen. And you've got a much much bigger tank. I'd say two and a half times. I can't yeah. Remember so it's got to be on that order it's two and a half three six, times bigger. Six six yeah. times the volume, because the ratio of mixed. Uh, uh, Basically, hydrogen is so much less dense. Yeah. I think we're looking at like the, yeah, the, volume. The, the volume here yeah. is going to be, I'm, I'm going to call it three times from memory. I, I don't have the figures memorized, but it is substantially larger. Right. Okay. Now, the point is, and, and I'm not going to ask the people who have this uh, memorized cold, but does anyone in the room who doesn't know care to hazard a guess as to what this oxidizer weighs compared to what this fuel weighs? Roughly. Eight, uh, eight, eight, eight times as much. Maybe eight probably, times. probably a little bit more, a little bit less, because they don't burn it in, a, in an exact stochastic ratio. They burn it either. I can't remember if they do burn oxygen rich or hydrogen rich, but they have a little bit more of one right. than the other. But as a first approximation, that's right. This little tank up here holds eight times by mass as much stuff as this huge tank down here. So that's why he was saying on the Saturn V, uh, you know. The tanks were much closer to the same size because the the, uh, uh, the the fuel the it was kerosene type yeah, kerosene. Yeah. Yeah. type substance was is much denser and much heavier than the liquid hydrogen that's used in the shuttle. And another way of thinking about this whole thing is you go up the hill with these two separate tanks, one's full of liquid oxygen, one's full of liquid hydrogen, 
And uh, another way of thinking about this whole thing is that it weighs about the same amount as one big tank full of water. Because what the engines do is you feed this liquid, liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen into the engines, you burn it, it makes steam. So uh, essentially the, the volume and weight of this whole thing together is about as much as one big tank full of water. And uh, it's just separated into the liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen going up. But that, I just want to give you an, a, 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 a feel for the fact that this weighs eight times, this little thing weighs eight times more than this big thing down here. Right. Yeah, that's a, and, that, and that's a big trade-off. I mean, you've got so many variables with rockets. I mean, you, you, you hear part, people argue, okay, well, hydrocarbons are the way to go. No, uh, uh, you've got to go with the efficiency of, of using liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. And there's, there's so many variables that it's hard to just make a cut and dry line saying one is, one is better than the other. And, and it really just comes down to a, a system as a whole. I mean, it took engineers 10 years to come up with this system where we flew to the moon and we came, we flew a whole bunch of hardware to the moon and we came back with this. This, this is all we got back from the, each Apollo flight. This is all we got back. Whatever they could stuff inside this little capsule. So it, it's quite a, an amazing feat of engineering w when it comes down to it. But yeah. all this for this is um, why they started scratching their heads towards the end of the Polo program. It's like, well, maybe we can we can work on this a little bit more and try to get a, um, something more akin to the shuttle. Yeah, that's that's the one of the reasons. Yesterday, I was saying if you, you, you gain a lot by dividing up your transportation system mm -hmm. into a piece that goes into or orbit right. and then a piece that goes from orbit to the, you know, the lunar orbit and then a piece that goes just lands from the lunar orbit to on, onto the moon because then each piece doesn't have to have to be so big. Right, yeah, it's each like piece doesn't have to be so big. Yeah, a, a, a gas stations along the way. Right. Uh, think about doing Apollo the way we did it is like, okay, you got to build a car that can go around the world unrefueled. Mm -hmm. In principle, you could do it. You know, basically yeah. build one big hunk and tanker truck. <laughs> but what you re but any car can drive around the world if there's a, if the, there's roads to connect it, you know, and ferries to get it right. across water and so forth. If you have gas stations along the way, yeah, that <laughs> yeah, that makes it a whole lot easier. Certainly. Another way to look at this thing, I don't know if. Uh, this comes comes apart. Apart. Okay, yeah, what I'd like to show is this here. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, no, no, I'd like to hold oh, okay. this, uh, keep this together. Uh, All right. And the reason why, um, another way to look at this, we talked about, uh, you know, breaking it up into different stages, what uh, goes into Earth orbit, what goes all the way to the moon and all that. Another way to think of it is all of this, the only thing it did was put this into low Earth orbit. In fact, you, you actually had to burn a little bit of that third stage for an orbit insertion. Yeah. Right. We started with a, on the pad with uh, this tank being full. And just to get into orbit, we had to go through all of that and burn some of this gas here. And then, to go to the moon, all of this just put this on a trajectory to go to the moon. And the little lunar module. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And to come back... Um, we started with a mostly full tank here and now wound up with an empty tank. We would have gotten all this back, but of course, uh, you know, this bottom part couldn't re-enter, so we had to throw that away and we burn up. But uh, yeah, uh, this whole thing, to get from the moon back to the earth, you start with a full tank of gas, you end up with an empty tank of gas, so you might as well just throw this away. Since you didn't have gas stations <laughs> to refill it with. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Very nice model. Thank you. I read somewhere that I can make a model like that for free. Yes. It's just um, paper. Yeah. Um, there is a website. Uh, if you go out to the, the table out there, um, I don't remember the website offhand. It's on, um, it's on the table, though. It, it, it is on the yeah. table, and there's a little QR code with the website, but the website is also listed on there. Uh, you can. Um, this is not the only model they have. They have like 50 models on their website, uh, anything. They do uh, real rockets. They do sci-fi rockets. You can download Star Wars ones. Um, it, it's it's uh, really interesting. This uh, took me about uh, maybe 10 to 15 hours to get it to this point. You can probably spend another 10 or 15 hours putting on the, all the little details and everything like that. But 
uh, I had a house to remodel, so I had to kind of treat it. Yeah, I don't know if you call it. Yeah, it, it, it certainly. Is. I mean, it, it 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 drives the concept there. So yeah, uh, certainly uh, check out that site. Um, they're free, and yeah, I mean, you just will have to print out the printer paper and get some cardboard, and and uh, you can build it. So. Okay. I've got a question from online. Okay. okay. I'm going to read it for okay. Oh, how much of the mass fraction do you gain or lose by just flying water for a thermal nuclear rocket since you don't have a cryo tank? Okay, now what do they mean thermonuclear or just nuclear? Because right now we don't know how to build or thermal. Or thermal. Let's assume he thermal. Didn't, thermal. Didn't mean to say yeah. thermal. Uh, okay. Fusion uh, rocket. Well, the ISP goes way down if, uh, as compared with hydrogen. If you just put. Uh, since water it, it, uh, basically is about nine times the mass of hydrogen alone. Nine times. Uh, H2O, okay, 16, well, 16, 18 versus 2. Yeah. Okay. So it's nine times the mass. It turns out your ISP goes down like the square root of that. So your, your specific impulse would be about divided by three. So then instead of your eight or nine hundred seconds of specific impulse, which you had for the Nerva rocket, you'd be back down to three hundred, which is okay. Yeah, that's one of the Could you turn oh. back because I, I think I okay. can explain this. Okay. Remember uh, when we first started talking about specific impulse, um, and, and specific impulse is your gas mileage. It's something you really want a big specific impulse if you can get it. Um, and, and what's it equal to? That the one th you can't change gravity, but you can change your exhaust velocity. So your goal, if you want the highest specific impulse you can, you want whatever's coming out of the back end of your rocket to be going as fast as you can possibly get it. And it's a whole lot e for the same amount of energy. You can make a little teeny tiny hydrogen atom go a lot faster than a big old oxygen atom. And that's and that's one one reason why the the. The, when you burn a uh, hydrocarbon, is you, you get a lot more than just water. You get all these other densities. You get CO2, Two, yeah. carbon monoxide. These molecules are a lot heavier. So while you're getting a lot more um, thrust, um, you're, um, yeah, it's just harder to accelerate those big ones. Ideally, you want the littlest mass possible. That's why ion en engines are so great. You're throwing electrons and, and ions uh, out there. The ideal thing would just be pure electrons at, at the highest velocity you can get them. Um, but then you, you have all sorts of... <laughs> you, have yeah. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you have charge imbalances. Yeah, yeah, you have charge imbalances. But, but yeah, going, going in that direction, yeah, you want the, the lightest thing possible uh, to go out the exhaust. And actually, they, they kind of played with that a little bit um, on, on some of these uh, uh, Saturn stages uh, because you, you have the ideal... Um, um, fuel mixtures and stuff to start out with, uh, but what they, what they learned is, okay, if we burn a little bit um, oxidizer rich, I believe, at, at the beginning of the burn, then you get rid of more of your mass initially and you have less mass to accelerate later. So what they would do is, is half, they'd burn oxidizer rich and halfway go to fuel rich, which was the really light hydrogen, and they managed to get um, a couple uh, hundred or a couple thousand pounds, I believe, of extra performance margin just by tweaking that uh, that uh, mixture a little bit. It'd be like on changing the carburation in your car or your right. airplane. Yeah. And, and and with that performance, they were able to add something like the the lunar rover to the Apollo missions later on. So just finding those little ideas sometimes end up giving you a big payoff as being able to send extra payloads to the moon. Uh, this might be a good time to pause and see if there are any other questions coming yeah. in. Okay. Uh, well, what are the fuels used in all the the smaller, you know, mid-sized rockets, the Atlas and the Delta um, and all that stuff? So Atlas, um, I believe they, 
hydrocarbon. They're, they're hydrocarbon, hydrocarbon for the first stage. Yeah, hydrocarbon first stage, and I believe almost and all sometimes the they have strap solid strap ions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think Delta is the same way. No, Delta is liquid Delta. oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Yeah, um, it is. They they've gone to, to try to get more efficient. More heavy. That's that's basically more core stages. And what about the European the Delta one? The the original, uh, the original, I, I believe okay, uh, the Delta they, fours are liquid oxygen. Uh, right? The Europeans they kind of went the shuttle route. They've got a liquid. Um, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, core stage with the solid rocket boosters on the side that um, get them some extra thrust. And that's, uh, if anybody's heard about the, I think this has been mentioned a little bit, the Liberty rocket uh, is where they're taking the um, the, the airing, um, airing core stage and throwing it in on top of the uh, solid rocket booster yes. um, le left over from the, the Ares-1 program. Yeah, basically so, they're taking advantage of some development work that's already been done. It, exactly. So instead of trying to go and develop this, this is already built. You just strap it onto this and this is mostly built. So uh, you, you kind of get something that's a little bit more ready to go. Now, inevitably they, they always run into some issues because, I mean, it, as far as intellectually, it's great. It's like. Um, one of the things they thought about early on in the shuttle program is, hey, we got these Saturn first boosters. Let's just stick a little space shuttle on top of that first stage booster and then, and then throw it to orbit. Well, the, the practicalities of, of how that works end up kind of complicating things sometimes. So it, it, it's always a great idea, but, um, and it quite possibly can, can work. It, um, but sometimes trying to Frankenstein these systems together doesn't always go as planned. There's a question from online about why does a Vesemir engine not work inside of an atmosphere? It's also, uh, the, the, that's one that's um, being uh, built actually uh, by um, Chang Diaz. And it's a variable specific impulse engine and it also runs with uh, basically high temperature ions. And you can get your ion source from a whatever, whether it's a, whatever source you want to. You can take like a nuclear energy source or a thermal, if we ever get thermonuclear reactions to go, you can get a thermonuclear energy source or you can just take microwaves and heat up from an electrical source and heat up your, 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 your propellant so that it's ionized and basically you're shoving plasma out, out the back. And in atmosphere, that doesn't work so well. But the idea that Chang Diaz has is that you would have this, this engine, you could tweak the specific impulse and the thrust, so that one, you're trying to get out, break out of orbit. So you're, you start out in low Earth orbit. Uh, this would be an, in, an upper stage engine. So, so for space to space transportation, you crank it to high thrust and not so quite so high specific impulse, so you can get enough thrust to break free of orbit without taking forever to do it. You know, without having to spiral around and around and around the Earth to, to get get going. Then, once you're in cruise mode, you change that to high specific impulse, low thrust, so you can continue to thrust, continue to build velocity, but use your propellant, remaining propellant more efficiently. I, I came in late. Did we already talk about the, the relationship between that specific impulse versus power required? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it that comes in yeah, that. Comes that, in that. I, I, yeah. I missed that earlier. And to give an idea on these trade offs with that is, is Apollo. I mean, they used a um, you know chemical engine to go to the moon. Um, I believe is is about a two day travel time on, yeah. on that order. Um, they've done some satellites where they've used ion engines to go to the moon, and it takes about six months. Mm -hmm. So it, th there's this big trade off: is you don't want to stick an astronaut mm -hmm. on something that's going to take six months to go to the moon. You, you need the, great the for gas mileage as long as it yeah. you don't care how yeah. long it takes you to get there. Well, exactly. That's with the Hayabusa. Yeah. I know I'm butchering the pronunciation, the JAXA mission to collect dust from a comet. Mm -hmm. It was using ion engine. Well, right. it's hydrogen and, engines. And, 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 and so it so took is, years. And, and so is Dawn uh, going to, uh, to the asteroid belt. It's uh, using, uh, uh, actually it's great for solar systems travel because you're already in voyages that are going to take you months to years, and an ion engine in that scale, when you're constantly thrusting, you have lots of time to build up your velocity. It can actually cut your time, yes. flight time. Yeah, but in lunar, lunar travel, or just, just going to Mars, it probably would not. It might cut your flight time 
to Mars if you had the high thrust brake free breakout stage right. or, or a Vasimer type engine where you can get high thrust to break break out of orbit and then continue to thrust uh, at a lower lower thrust higher specific impulse to continue to build your velocity to get you out there faster and going to, and even you don't even have to go to the far parts of the solar system what I think Cheng Diaz is trying to do with Vasimir it is to go to Mars, really, yeah. um, I believe that it's maybe six some, six months. Day, Thirty-eight days, one way. Yeah, and and compared to maybe uh, that's, something that's, like six months. With that, that is a great improvement over the 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 typical Hohmann orbit transfer that you typically model, which is typically seven, eight months, or nine months, depending on where Earth and Mars are in their relative orbits. Right. Uh, whether Mars is, is near aphelion or perihelion. Certainly, yeah. And and I mean all these all these different technologies they own they all have their own place in in, in all of the system. I mean you're you're always gonna for upper stages you're always gonna want uh, chemical, but but uh, high energy for lower stages you really want to go. You need that thrust to get off the ground. You need to get going. Um, so yeah. and then and for in space you want something that that's the most efficient as possible. Otherwise your payload weights just grow out of control. Yeah. Basically, when you're lifting off the surface of the Earth, if your acceleration isn't at least one g, you're, you're not, not going, going anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, the, the the Saturn V is a case in point where you just started out just barely. Yeah. Because the vehicle weighed six million pounds, fully loaded, crew, supplies, and everything. And, and the thrust on what liftoff was seven and a half million pounds. So you had a quarter and a one and a quarter g of thrust and a quarter g of gravity down. So the actual acceleration at the beginning was not 32 feet per second if per you second. Go, go watch four, the Apollo videos but, versus but, a shuttle. Yeah, but it's feet just per second per second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The interesting comparative figure for the shuttle is one and a half g's. So the, you see the shuttle practically leap off the pad, and you watch the Saturn struggle to strain off the pad, yeah. and the difference is just the difference between one and a quarter G's and one and a half. Yeah. yeah. Or, Unbelievable or, amount of difference. Yeah, or put it this way, as, as, as we always joked when we, we, the shuttle was being developed, you, if you have, have, light, have ignited the main engines, you can still shut down. But once you put those light up those solids, that vehicle is going somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and that's the big trade-off too with, with the, these propulsion systems. It, it is like you said with the solids. Once it's on, it's on, and until it either shuts off or something goes wrong, you're you're going somewhere. Whereas, whereas the big advantage with the liquid and, and, and why they initially went with all liquid design in the Saturn is if you had an issue, you could shut this down, hopefully, before something catastrophic happened. Um, and you had an escape tower on top. And, and you and had the escape tower on top. To that, that, that's, a, that's a whole other part of, of the, the safety equation. Um, but, but as far as it, is trying to do something like that, and the other advantage to, to liquids is, is you've got your oxidizer up here and your fuel down here. Now they're close to each other, but to really get a good combustion going, they need to be mixed. So if something was to go wrong and this explodes, you don't have quite the, the chemical potential as you could have as if they were all mixed together. And, and that's what solids are, is you've got the fuel, the oxidizer, it's all in, intermixed. So if something goes wrong and it just goes, it's got that potential. Um, so, so that's another trade-off with these rockets is, um, I mean, if you want um, as just safety at, at, at all other costs, you, you would go to a liquid system, but then you got to make the trade-off. So you get into a larger, more complex system, whereas the solids are nice and dense, and you can put them in a, in a much smaller vehicle. Uh, yeah, just out of quick curiosity, did anybody have any, you know, we, we had uh, advertised like three topics here. Did anybody have any questions about orbital dynamics or life support? Yeah, let's move on to life support. Okay, okay. all right. Well, that, that was something that um, I, I spent the, the first part of my career uh, doing. And um, so if, if I was to just take this room right now, seal it off, get a bunch of plastic, seal those off, what's the first thing you guys are going to want to worry about? Bathroom. Bathroom. Oh, bathroom. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. What's the second thing? Okay. <laughs> I really need to go pee. <laughs> Where's my 
what, what's going to happen to my air supply? <laughs> right. Oxygen right. Gonna hold and, um, and, it's, and it's funny, um, after 9-11, Homeland Security um, kind of started thinking about, hey, what, are, what should we tell people to do and if, uh, and, uh, the, um, if a chemical attack or something happened? And that's what they said to do. Go get some plastic and seal yourself in a room. Well, it's not the brightest idea because um, actually one of the first things you have to worry about is a lot of people aren't aware of this. When you breathe out, you breathe out a lot of moisture in your breath. And the humidity in the room is going to start slowly growing. Um, so that's one concern. And then uh, another concern is just, um, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide build up. That can is, is you... Um, you breathe that out, and once the, the amount of carbon dioxide gets to a high enough level, you start getting headaches, uh, and then eventually you're going to pass out. Yeah, um, even carbon dioxide can build right. up to toxic levels given enough time. And, and then eventually, you, you got to start worrying about, okay, you start to consume the amount of oxygen in, in the room and things like that. But th those are kind of the, the, the three big ones it, is trying to get rid of this humidity, uh, the, the moisture in the air that you're adding, um, that getting rid of the CO2 and then you got to get the, the oxygen um, back into the room. And then kind of a, on an aside to that is um, if you were to go to um, a pure oxygen environment, uh, you go, oh, okay, hey, that's, that's not worried so much about oxygen, let's just make it all oxygen instead of um, uh, right now in, in our normal atmosphere we've got 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. and um, Things burn a lot, yeah, don't, don't burn as well don't, don't, in our environment. What yeah, they found after the, the Apollo <laughs> 1 fire, the Apollo 1 fire is they had a pure oxygen environment and they found you could just take a chunk of aluminum and light it and it would burn yeah. in, in that environment. So that gives you the idea of just how flammable things can be in a pure oxygen yeah, well, environment. Well, aluminum has, has a good combustible potential anyway. They right. use it for a thermite reaction. Yeah, they, it, yeah it, that's it's one in of powdered the, form, but it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's but it does it, it goes a lot easier in, in, in a pure, pure oxygen, oxygen environment. And so you, so. you ex, and also in the long term, in the short term, we can handle a pure oxygen environment. They, on the moon, right. all the way to the moon, the Apollo astronauts breathe the pure oxygen environment, mm -hmm. but it was at 5 PSI, not right. 15 PSI. Yeah, the, the critical thing it, it, with, with oxygen is, so right now I think it, if, you, um, if you take in terms of the, the atmosphere, you're, you're at uh, right now about 14.7 um, PSI. And for your purists out there, I'm going to add an A for the PSI absolute. So, <laughs> uh, the um, so I, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that the partial pressure of oxygen is around 3 yeah. uh, PSI. So, so like he was saying, um, Apollo 1 fire, they found out that um, you, you just can't have a pure oxygen environment. And so they went to correct that, but it was just going to be too much weight to try to take a pure mixed environment on all the way to the moon and back. And, and plus, you also run into issues with the nitrogen and, and bends and things like that. So they had a nitrogen-oxygen mix on launch, and then once they got, uh, I believe, um, either in Earth orbit or once they were going to the moon, then they transitioned over to a uh, more of a pure oxygen environment yeah. there. And, and actually, in the longer term, and, you know, over, over weeks and months, human beings do much better if we do have nitrogen. Yeah. You, and, yeah, and yeah. most life support systems do. In fact, if you want to go to a longer term life support and you want to go to any system, let's say in a, in a, in a lunar colony or a Mars settlement where you want to grow your own food, you're going to need that uh, nitrogen for the plants right. to operate. Yeah, they, they, they get, get a closed loop life support system where you have plants and, and humans involved. Yeah, you need that nitrogen. But, but the key is, is, is you want to try to keep this oxygen level around 3 PSI. So if you bring down the nitrogen and, and keep this um, oxygen level around PSI, that, that's what, and I, I think there's some space medicine people involved here who know a little bit more about this. I, I just get told as an engineer, we want this around this level. So, um, so that was one of the things, that it, and like with the spacesuits, the spacesuits like to be at a low pressure because they're balloons and it's easier to bend a, uh, 
a low pressure balloon than a high pressure balloon. So that's why they, they wanted to, to stay with these lower pressure environments. And even um, even then, you try to put sort of a bellows arrangement in the major joints right, yeah. so that it, you can equalize the volume. And mm -hmm. if you if you can keep the volume more or less equal, you can do the bending. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, so, so, okay. Yeah, I was about to say, as as an operations guy, uh, that kind of drove us nuts because uh, whenever we wanted to do an EVA, you'd have to take an astronaut from a cabin environment that might be at 14.7, or and, and in practice we drop that down to 10.2, and that might be a separate side discussion. But from 10.2 down to, which is a nitrogen oxygen environment at 10.2 pounds per square inch, down to that pure oxygen environment at three pounds per square inch, and if you think about it, that's kind of like uh, being on a deep sea dive and coming from a high pressure way down deep and coming up to the surface and. The problem there, you get into things like the bends. So, uh, come out. you just want to do it in a way that's not going to make them sick. Exactly. So, in order to get ready to do a spacewalk, uh, we had, and there were, there were many different ways we went about this, but one of the things we had to do is we had to purge the nitrogen out of the blood of the astronauts before they got into their spacesuit. So, we would have this various pre breathe protocols where they would go on oxygen to get ready for their spacewalk. Yeah. Questions were completely different. Right. Questions were. Okay, you're going to pre-read for a couple hours, hop in your suit, go. Yeah. It, it, yeah. The suit has to run at a higher pressure. Right. So the trade-off the trade -off there was if you're, in a, if you're in an American suit, you've just wasted an astronaut's entire day beforehand. Or night, yeah. Yeah. If you're, uh, Russian. if you're in a Russian suit, you've just wasted the cosmonaut's day after the EVA because now he's one giant bruise. <laughs> he's totally exhausted. Oh, and, and, and that's the way they treat their astronauts. They're a little bit more expendable. They, they, yeah. Our, not, 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 not to knock, but we treat our astronauts very nicely. Like, yeah. Russians, in the Second like World War. <laughs> and, 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 and maybe one point to, to, to um, that maybe characterize that a little bit mm -hmm. is, uh, I mean, shuttle, shuttle environment it is pretty benign. I mean, you, if, if you're getting up towards the high 70 degree mark, I mean, that, that's raising red flags. And, and so... Uh, and astronauts, they're not going to complain on orbit. And maybe the, it, I think what it, there was a little bit of feedback after this one mission is like, you know, when we were in this part of the mid deck, it felt a little warm. And it's like, do you live in Houston? It was 70 degrees in there. <laughs> we're down here baking. <laughs> so, so, so it's a little bit different mindset. You know, it, it, yeah. it is a little bit different mindset. And, and I mean, it, it's it's a hazardous environment. You want to make sure that, that things are within the norms. And, and they're, um, but anyway, let's that, that, kind of go back to the life support thing. And, and so we got our two issues. We got CO2 and, and we've got water in the air. And, um, and oxygen. And you got your you got oxygen, but but we're concerned about trying to get rid of these two things because we can hold our breath for only so long and before these are, are going to start being issues. And, um, and and what shuttle does for CO two is um, well we have an air circulation system, and uh, so you got a fan, and I'm just going to draw a crude fan. I know this isn't quite right here, but you have an inlet, and so the air comes in, goes through the fan, and, and um, you have a special chemical um, that's called lithium hydroxide, and uh, they've got these canisters uh, full of this material, and you blow the air through here, and um, the, the lithium hydroxide grabs onto the carbon uh, dioxide, and um, so... Um, you, that's how you remove the uh, CO2. So you throw your uh, clean air back into the cabin uh, where you got your happy astronauts. Um, so that takes care of the CO2 problem. Now the thing is, it, is uh, these things only have a particular amount of absorption uh, capability. <laughs> So you, they, they run two of these cans at a time, and they, they just swap them out every uh, I think it's like six to 12 hours, depending on how fresh or new they are. And then um, you go stow them somewhere. Well, it, it kind of gets old. After, after two weeks, you've gone through almost 50 of these cans, something on that order um, of magnitude. Um, now, a station, what uh, they've got is they've got an, another chemical um, that absorbs the, the CO2, but what they're able to do is um, is they'll take this 
and they'll um, close the system off. They actually have two of these. So, um, so they'll use um, one at a time. And so once this one gets full, they switch over to the empty one, and they'll start heating this up, and that undoes the chemical reaction. So you release your CO2, and you got this nice vacuum port because you have a lot of vacuum in space, and you just shove the uh, fuel overboard, or that, that CO2 overboard. And, and from there, you can go even fancier where you got a, a chemical process where you can actually use that CO2 and create um, methane, which then you, um, um, I believe you have to combine it with uh, hydrogen and then um, and go that way. So uh, that's the, kind of the, the more black arts uh, of life support. But they, I mean, the simple idea is, is you're extracting the CO2 from the atmosphere by these um, chemical reactions. Um, the moisture uh, gets a little bit trickier because you, you need, again, the most simplest solution is you could use a desiccant. That, that silica gel you find in your shoes or something you buy at the store, that stuff loves water. Um, for a very short mission on the order of two days, it actually, instead of trying to get into a really complex system of getting the, the, all that water out of the air, uh, desiccants actually provide a great uh, mass um, savings for a very short mission. But, but going beyond that, again, if you were to go try to do something like station or even to go to Mars, you're, the amount of desiccant you'd have to carry with you would just be completely astronomical. So um, they go more uh, towards a, um, trying to it, so akin to our AC units where you provide a, a cold air source or a cold source um, and you condense the humidity out of the air. And but what's nice about um, your AC system at home is it condenses and water flows down into the tube and goes out. Well, in space. Water's the water condenses and stays there. <laughs> yeah. So um, what shuttle did is they have a, what they call the uh, humidity separator, or it's basically a, a centrifuge that it, you try to blow the air in the centrifuge and you um, um, blow the, uh, you get the moisture going out of the system that way. And actually then it, it'll, it'll go into um, a, um, a holding tank and then once they get enough of this wastewater, uh, that just gets dumped overboard into the vacuum again. So uh, that, that's one way. And on, uh, on station, they reuse that water. That water gets processed, so you get to drink your own uh, uh, breath and, and sweat that's, that's come off your body all in your own urine. Do, but, do you have a feel for uh, how, how much of this lung water a person generates every day? It's been a while since, since I've been doing uh, do that. Um, it's not a, 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 a huge contribution, but um, may, maybe someone online might know um, what the numbers are offhand. Yeah, it, uh, on the order of maybe a couple pounds. It, it's not a huge contribution when you think about the whole water cycle. Um, but I mean, when you really go into a closed loop system and you start thinking about going to Mars again, it all adds up. I was listening to an astronaut presentation, not Clay Anderson, but it was in another event and he made the joke, it's like yesterday's coffee is today's coffee. <laughs> <laughs> about urine processing. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, that's, and that's, the, that's the whole idea behind um, we, I mean, we can, we can send people to space today and keep them alive. It's just a matter of, of how much mass you need to send with them to keep them alive. And as we start thinking about doing things like going to the moon, going to Mars, it just becomes an impracticality with the systems that we've, we've used. Um, even the station systems are new. They've only, some of these systems have been operating 10 years at the most. Um, if you were to, do, um, and, and they break down a lot. So you, you need a system that is, is going to go to Mars. And uh, I mean, you're talking about if the Vasimir thing works out, you got a couple months uh, going to Mars, you got a couple months on Mars, and then a couple months back. And all this stuff has to work perfect, or else your astronaut isn't happy anymore. 
or dead. dead. Do you know what they used in uh, the Skylab? You know, I don't know what they used um, as far as CO2 for Skylab. Um, I know that Apollo, they used uh, lithium hydroxide. Like, um, And what, what you see in Skylab Apollo 13, too. it is these, um, they had the canisters. It's just that they had a different shaped canister on the command module as for the lunar module. And so they had to make this fancy, uh, you know, you're trying to put a square peg in a round hole kind of thing, and, and they made it work. Um, it, it came down to the, the, the lithium hydroxide there. Um, now, the, now the oxygen on the, the shuttle system is, um, is really a neat thing because um, they, they use fuel cells. Um, and so uh, fuel cells, you've got your uh, hydrogen and oxygen, and, and um, you've got your nice fancy fuel cell and uh, you put the two together and you get um, uh, electricity and, um, and water mm -hmm. out this side of it. So you're carrying this oxygen for the fuel cell anyways and, and so you just use the same tankage uh, to provide the, uh, the crew. Um, but then you've got this water left over that you can uh, give to the crew as well and that's where uh, a lot of their drinking water comes from. You also get heat. Yes, you also get heat, and that and that's very important because something like your car generates a lot of waste heat. You just dump it out to the atmosphere. Well, um, space shuttle, you don't have atmosphere, so you got to get rid of this waste heat. And so this this all ties into um, one reason my job was was doing life support and active thermal control because you had to worry about dumping this waste heat. You even have to worry about the waste heat coming from the people. So the people uh, mount, um, So I thought the temperature in space was extremely cold. Why is getting rid of heat? The well, it, it's 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 not just a, as simple as you know throwing a radiator or something like. Uh, uh, well, how, we have radiators. That. Yeah. It's because if you're inside the world's biggest thermos, and that is just the most amazing insulator. So yeah. the background temperature may be cold, but getting heat, you know, the yeah. your own body heat, if nothing else. Yeah will just build and build and build, and it's hard to get rid of it if you don't have some kind of radiator. And yeah. the problem is, even with a radiator, I mean, like on Earth, you can, air molecules will go in, heat up, and then as they go through the radiator, they'll be drawn away, like they'll exhaust out the top and pull in cold air from the bottom, yeah. and there's no air in space. Things well, we that, I mean, if you're only, okay. if so you're only same. running it at 10 PSI or whatever, yeah. then and air the heat transfer is probably very inefficient. Correct. Well, and it's like yeah. even when the, the payload bay doors open on the shuttle, uh, there's a radiator that opens on, it's on one side of the payload bay doors that is used to radiate heat away. Right. From the yeah, if you look on the inside of the radiator doors, you've got this big silver panel. It's actually in four sections. And uh, so you have all these tubes in here. Uh, well, I guess they, they go through each section, and then you've got a flex hose that connects each of all these together. And so you just got have this big surface, and yeah, what you're trying to do is point the radiators away from the sun and out into the cold of space. So, um, but these don't actually get very hot as, as far as when we think about something trying to get rid of heat. I, um, I think that the highest uh, we've seen, you know, maybe around 100, 120 degrees. Maybe. That would is be, there a fluid in them? Or is yeah, there, a, uh, there's a Freon uh, loop. So, um, so the idea is, is this is your cold source. And you have your Freon loops, um, and you got a whole bunch of avionics that are hooked up to cold plates, which are just essentially just, uh, they got all these tube paths in them, and you put, you just bolt the avionics to those and, and cool those down. And then the Freon, um, the Freon is hazardous to people, so you don't want the Freon going in, inside the cabin, so you got a heat exchanger. And then you actually have a water uh, cooling system inside the vehicle, so if that was the leak, it, it was okay. Um, and then you've got another heat exchanger, which actually goes to your air um, and cools down uh, the air and the crew. Um, so you've got this whole complex system. Now, if this starts to, if the sun starts to shine on this, Oops, you start having um, an issue because this will actually start to heat up versus, versus cool. And that's where a lot of this wastewater comes in, is um, I don't know if anybody's ever seen um, th this chemistry uh, experiment um, that I saw in college where they take 
a, some water and put it inside a bell jar and pull a vacuum on it. And once you start getting the vacuum down, the water starts boiling, even though it's, it's cool, and that the energy of the molecules leaving the water, the, leave the rest of the water, um, gets cold, colder and colder until it will freeze. And so they use that same process in space where they'll take, they've got, um, this generates a lot more water than the astronauts can drink. And so they just dump this on, um, in what they call the flash evaporator system. So it's just going, um, just boiling str um, straight off. And, and that provides additional cooling to here. Um, and actually this can get, um, if you uh, run this too much, you can actually um, start freezing some of the, the components. So you, you gotta be careful not to freeze this water loop over here. Um, so, so, so there's a lot of, um, sensors in there that detect, okay, if I'm at this, this temperature, I need to shut off. And it, it gets to be um, a pretty uh, uh, complex system in, in, in trying to control all of this. So and then in the station cooling system, they use uh, ammonia instead of freon, right? Yeah, they use ammonia instead of freon. And then they've got the same toxic. issue, whereas the ammonia <laughs> can't go inside the cabin uh, as well. So that, then they have uh, and, another heat exchanger. And just an add-on to that about the radiator panels, that's the reason um, the, the shuttle launch windows are very tightly controlled is because the beta angle cutouts of the radiators would be facing the sun based on the orbits. Right, yeah, the, the more sun exposure you get, the more of this, and, and they try not to use this system because whatever water they, um, they have left over, they bag it and transfer it over to station. Because the station likes as much water as possible. Yes, they do. I'd, I'd really like to make the point that uh, it makes a tremendous difference what your orientation to the sun is. And when it, I say tremendous, yes. I mean hundreds of degrees. Right. From, then, from like negative 200 in the shade and positive 200 in the sun, roughly. Yeah. If you, well, it, it depends on coatings and stuff and just how long you let it sit. Um, and, you know, before we had a space station, there was a little bit of an art to which way do you point the shuttle to accomplish what. You might have something in the payload bay that's like an astronomical instrument that wants to look at deep space. Well, if you just point the shuttle payload bay to deep space all the time, it gets very, very cold. So the ideal, the shuttle was really designed to point those radiators at the Earth, because the Earth radiates a certain amount of heat, and everything was sized just so that you could fly and fly and fly forever, uh, you know, pointing those radiators at the heat without getting too hot or too cold. And whenever you, you deviate from that, you have to, you know, either spend so much time heating back up or so much time cooling off. Now, when you're tied to the space station, you're not really pointing right at the <laughs> Earth anymore, and so now you've got a whole different set of constraints, and that's where your things like beta angle, which is really the angle between the, the sun and, and uh, the Earth and the space station, the way that all plays together, um, that starts becoming important because you just can't move the, the shuttle to face the way you want to anymore. Yeah, this is what he's talking about. So when you're going around in, in an orbit and the sun's out here, um, this is how shuttle likes to fly with, with the radiators to the earth. It's not too hot or too cold, it's just right. And, um, and, and so if it's by itself, you, this is the orbit that it usually fly. Uh, one interesting um, mission uh, we had was SCS-121, and those who are familiar with the flight, uh, might remember that there was a thruster heater failure. Uh, they, that's one thing about the whole vehicle it, it, is you want to try to keep things not too hot and not too cold. And so there's a lot of heaters on the vehicle that people aren't really aware of that keep certain components at just the right temperatures. So they had a heater failure. And, and so instead of wasting a lot of time trying to replace that heater, they flew anyways and flew in a, um, this, this is called a, um, LVLH, local, mm -hmm. vertical, local, horizontal. But it's basically an Earth-oriented attitude. The payload bay always points to Earth. And what they um, did on that mission for short periods of time is they did a sun-oriented attitude uh, where essentially they're trying to keep uh, one part of the vehicle pointed at the sun. Um, and uh, I believe, I I'm just going to draw a generic one so but so if this is the earth oriented one the sun oriented one if you're trying to always uh, keep the same position towards the sun is uh, like this so, so now on this side of the orbit you're actually uh, point, pointed with the radiators towards the sun 
Now, um, I mean, how many radiators part of the, um, part of the orbit point towards the sun? Uh, you can compensate with that with that flash evaporated system that we were talking about. But uh, one interesting side effect was this is also if you're looking at the um, at uh, a side view as as the uh, orbiter's traveling uh, with the uh, it normally goes with the uh, tail uh, into the velocity vector because if there's a piece of debris here and you run into it it's hitting all the engines and heavy hardware that you don't need immediately uh, instead of going into the crew cabin. Um, so that, that, that's one reason they, they fly like that. And they, they really don't want the radiators going into the velocity vector. So if, if you look at the other orientation of this, well, what we found was uh, on that mission, we were flying uh, really low to catch up to the station. And uh, I'll talk about the orbital mechanics of that a little bit later if people have questions. But we were flying really low, and at parts of the orbit, the radiator is pointed, the velocity vector was pointed at the radiators, and we were flying so low that suddenly the radiator temperature started spiking. And it was because we were dipping into the atmosphere enough that it completely overwhelmed the, the FEST system and, and shut it off. Because it was like, I can't control this, I need to shut down, there's something wrong. And, and so we saw some, so, but, but it was only for short periods of time, and so you got out of it, and it was just that one point in the orbit where you would just dip in there. And, and so it was really an interesting mission in that uh, respect. But, but that's got to be an operationally, that's got to be really scary because every orbit now, you have a system shutting off that you got to remember to turn back yeah, on. Yeah, turn, turn back on. I hope it cools and, off before you come around again. Yeah, and, and this is while the crew is sleeping. And you don't want to wake up the crew because then that throws off your whole operational schedule. So. And the first um, time it happened, I'm sure they didn't realize it was... It, it, we didn't. We didn't know during the rest of the mission what was going on. Until later, we went to that uh, orientation later in the mission, and we were like, "Okay, we're gonna have run into this issue again," and nothing happened. And we're like, well, "Why isn't it happening again? What, what was magical about this?" And it, and it ended up going back. I mean, as a Eclipse life support person. It's, it runs into, the, the environments are a little bit dependent on altitude, but really it's not that dependent on altitude. But once we started having to deal with this, you know, we don't normally dip into the atmosphere. We were only flying at, at something like uh, 85 nautical miles or something. It is stations up at like 200-ish. 230 yeah. 230 nautical yeah. miles. So we were really low uh, for that mission. And that was, I, I believe that was uh, the second time they had ever flown that way. And, the, and the, uh, the other time they were flying in our normal orientation, which never points to radiator towards the velocity vector. So it, and, it, and it was really interesting. We might not have seen it. it. It just happened at the same time we were at the lowest point in the orbit was when we were pointed towards the sun. If it had been out of sync, we never would have seen this. It's it's one of those things. This it's one of those things in the space business that uh, just kind of pops up. The gremlins in the system kind of pop up. We have a comment from the chat log that says uh, Skylab used regenerative C2 removal system using canisters of molecular seeds, specifically zeolite. Okay, oh. that's one thing I did not know. So so I, I have heard of zeolite before, but I did <laughs> yeah. not know that they used that on Skylab. So thank you to the audience. On the recycled water, do they add uh, minerals or something to it, or are they drinking distilled water? I think they're just pretty much yeah. drinking it's distilled water. Yeah, yeah, they usually. Um, I think when they package it in the uh, iodine, yeah, they, they add iodine. iodine. Yeah, yeah. Um, some kind of yeah, I think that's a, um, kills back bacteria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think that they, they try to keep the, that active. One of the issues with moving water from the shuttle to the station. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, there were Russian standards <laughs> yeah. that, uh, that the shuttles, the, 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 sh the water that was scavenged from the shuttle's fuel cells was not meeting the Russian quality standards because it was too pure. And so they needed to add chemicals to the water to make it acceptable. Well, that right. makes and, sense. and as far as that, that comes into be, because they were separating that water using electrical process. I, I or it's yeah. literally yeah. pure. H2O. Yeah, yeah, if you drink distilled water, which that is, mm -hmm. uh, 
it's a different pH. You need to eat, drink slightly basic, I think, water. Hmm. And your body doesn't adjust right. I mean, if okay. you drink distilled water all the right. time, you'll, you'll get sick. Okay. You? I did not know that. So I think they do take vitamin supplements. Or yeah, yeah, maybe they take so, mineral so, pills. But yeah, I'll, I'll have to look into that one. I was not, not aware of that issue. Because so. you can get a dehumidifier. You know, if you drink water out of your dehumidifier at home, if it's distilled, you know, if you keep it from getting moldy, uh -huh. uh, you'll distill water like that. It's not good for you. Yeah, for okay. Yeah. But that's not a matter of, you know, a few days. That's like months, you know. You get sick eventually. No, I no, it's not that long. It only take a couple days. Really? Yeah. 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 Not moves that fast. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you probably get the shits right away. Yeah. Um, you know, after day or two. Any other questions from the or questions from the uh, online folks? Or? No, I, I that's the only one I've seen recently. Okay. I think that was most of what I had on life. I, I think I delved a little bit more into life support than I thought I might. But um. I, I want to kind of mention, you know, we talked, you know, when you drew the diagram there, I think it was kind of interesting. Uh, the way uh, the life support on shuttle is also tied into the electrical power system and is also tied into the thermal system. So you, you kind of, no matter which piece you're working on, you have to kind of think about the other two pieces, no matter what you're doing. Because mm -hmm. of the, the everything design uses of power and generates heat. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas on different systems, like on the space station where they don't use fuel cells, the, the three systems are not as closely tied to each other. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, balanced uh, system. So how long can the shuttle go? If they're using fuel cells, they must have a supply of oxygen and hydrogen. Right. They have five, five tanks. By the toilet. Right. So we have oh, another yeah. online that, question for how long, think think do how long do you think it'll take before we start using algae to balance the CO2 in the electric system? I'm not a biologist. I cannot speak to that. <laughs> so, like, I, I've moved on from the, the life support field. So. You know, really, if you look at uh, long-term life support, you, know, you look at it in terms of what an astronaut consumes, one person per day, and uh, you're going to be weight limited, you know, more weight than volume. And if you look at it in terms of weight, the number one weight consumable is not oxygen, it is not food, it is water. And so that is the, you know, you'll notice uh, space station does not make up you know, there's no fuel cells that makes extra water for the space station. So, and when we first put it up there, it was the very deep. Not? What's that? Sabadier? Yeah, that's the recent development. Yeah, it does, it, that produces water, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. But when we first put it up, we didn't have that, mm -hmm. and it was dependent on shuttle flights to keep bringing up water, and which was a marriage made in heaven because the shuttle always had too much water. So instead of just dumping it overboard like we did on all the flights before Space Station was up there, we collected it in, in bags on board, and then we would ferry these bags over, and you know we'd have extra water for Station. Well, you know, shuttle's going away, and we almost need something like Sabatier to make water on station or else our resupply flights would be mostly water and, and very little else. And after the Columbia accident, when station went from three crew to two crew because shuttle couldn't come and it, they were a really water limited. The key factor yeah. was the water versus any yeah. food or anything else. Yeah. Yeah. You, you need that water and yeah, you need to go to a closed, closed loop system in order to make that work. So I noticed last night with the commercial things that definitely the cargo, bringing cargo up and bringing crew up are two totally different problems. Mm -hmm. What kind of well, life support, but heat and environment do they use for the cargo? Anything they must Nothing have? consumes oxygen. Well, nothing generates electricity either. Oh, or, yes, or it heat. does. Or, <laughs> no, you do cargo. have heat. Oh, you absolutely. Have avionics oh. involved. Yeah. yeah. yeah so uh, now, depending on, on the heat load, you can handle that passively. Just, uh, I mean, if you uh, have the right systems, you, you can do that passively. You, you might, on a, a, a more complex electrical system, you, you might have to have a, 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 a cooling system. I know the, the batteries on station. Um, they're, they're tied into the thermal system because um, they, they expend a lot of heat. But Matter of fact, there's The cargo vehicles really don't use or don't produce a whole lot of excess heat. 
Yeah, I, I, I think most, most of them have got to be passive. Right, right, right. Most of them can get away with things, though, if they do have active systems, they can get away with, with things like fixed radiators. They're just yes. applied to the side yeah. of the vehicle yeah. well, instead about, of something that pops out uh, and turns. Are they pressurized? The sun. Uh, yes, some of them are. Um, I, I believe both H the H HTV, the disc launch from Japan, has a mm -hmm. pressurized and unpressurized car. All, yeah. all of them progress the HTV, the European. ATV, they're all pressurized to basically one atmosphere because when they mate to the station, you know, they need to have just about equal pressures, you know, so that they can open the doors. Yeah. And, then and there's, the there's no sense. Pressurized section for like pumps. And Some of them do. Yeah. Like yeah. The, the HTV Japanese base. HTV is the only one with an unpressurized right. section. Well, SpaceX, when they get theirs, yeah, they'll, they'll have the pressurized right. 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 But then, but then, uh, like the, the ATV, um, I believe they have. Um, some some of them HGV, have dedicated do uh, water <laughs> and fuel propellant um, for, for like for progress as yeah. propellant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. progress as propellant and uh, things like that. So yeah, yeah, the cargo. Um, yeah, you get these uh, pros and cons it, it, as far as it, you know what's best to bring up on a crew vehicle, what's best to bring up on a cargo vehicle. And, and yeah, I mean you, when you talk about cargo, you know we we might think of you know empty. Con or like filled containers of just stuff, but you, know, you gotta you gotta think about liquids and, and propellant and, and I mean you can't just say, Oh, that's let's throw some extra uh, water in the propellant tanks because we need more water. You, you gotta kinda balance all of that. So. And and it, it, another thing that a lot of people don't think about is these cargo vehicles all pro provide a very valuable function in getting rid of trash because it's not really practical to just hold your breath, open a window, and use something and shut it. That doesn't work at all. So, uh, you know, what they typically do is when one of these cargo vehicles comes up, they'll empty it, stow that stuff on board, and I don't know if you've been looking at video of the inside of the space station, literally, but it, it kind of reminds me of a, of a World War II submarine, how everything is just sort of packed everywhere. Yeah. Space is very limited. But they'll unload this uh, cargo module or cargo vehicle, whatever you have, and uh, so when they get it empty, they start filling it back full of trash. And uh, usually you know, that cram it full, <laughs> just yeah, absolutely full, as much as I can fit. Yeah. Not having your trash guy come every week, but come once every three months, and you've got to empty your garage or even trash. longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like what like Clay was talking about is like if you just threw something out, it could be months to years before it ends up deorbiting, even though you're in Leo. Yeah, yeah, because I believe one one thing the uh, the Russians did was they had an old suit, space suit. Um, that they weren't using anymore. And one neat thing they did with that is they put a ham radio transmitter inside the suit, and then during an EVA, they just tossed the, uh, the suit away, and, and then um, it became its own little mini satellite. It had it, you know, a light support system or a pressurized system in there, and, and um, I believe it lasted for uh, several weeks before it finally burned up in the atmosphere. And like space trash is a problem, so like there's been companies who are proposing like putting like parachutes almost on satellites that can be deployed at the end of the life of a satellite so that it picks up enough atmosphere to turn that direction. And that, I think, is a wonderful segue into orbital uh, mechanics. Uh, I'm, uh, pro I can't go anywhere near into the deep business as Larry could have or, or something like that, but uh, I got into this, and you'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll relate to this. Um, I got involved in, uh, the, years and years ago, I worked on uh, the LDEF spacecraft, which was Long Duration Exposure Facility. And that thing was uh, a test bed for materials. We just stuck it up there, and the idea was that we'll leave it up there about a year or so, and then come back and pick it up and take it down to Earth and study it and study how the materials, uh, you know, uh, many, many different materials that we yeah. put on it was would almost, react to the space environment. Yeah, it was almost like you, you, you've got this big cylinder, and like each section like might be like this big, and you've just got like dozens of these different types of materials on the outside of it. It looks like almost like a kaleidoscope or something yeah, like that. Yeah, it does. It was really neat. Uh, we ended up leaving it up. Uh, the idea was we were going to uh, throw it out there and come back and get it, and uh, something called the uh, uh, Challenger accident kind of got in the way, and it was like six years before we got back up there. So we got a much more thorough test than we originally intended. Um, and one of the things about that uh, spacecraft was it, it kept an attitude, passively kept an attitude, so it was always facing the same direction. And... Uh, you know, we talk about space being a vacuum. The same direction relative to the Earth or relative to the Sun? Relative or to the Earth. I guess space, okay. So it was always, you know, uh, it, it, you would, it would always maintain uh, the same uh, velocity vector, the same side 
was always facing forward, okay, as it went around. It was in a local vertical, local horizontal. That's the jargon for facing the same direction relative to the Earth. Um, and because of that, we talk about space being a vacuum, but it's not a perfect vacuum. And way up there, one of the things that you encounter that you don't encounter very much of down here is atomic oxygen. You know, we're used to having uh, O2. And, uh, you know, you go back to your chemistry, that's just an oxygen mo molecule connected to a, another oxygen molecule. Well, up there, because the pressure is so low and there's so much energy available from the sun and things like that and various other reasons, uh, this bond can be broken and you'll have lone oxygen mo molecules floating around all by themselves. And again, if you remember from your, your chemistry classes, oxygen really likes to combine with other things. So if you run into uh, a, a, an oxygen molecule all by itself, no matter what you are, it's going to bond to you. And if you're like made out of steel, it's going to rust that little spot. If you're made out of plastic, it's going to break the bonds in your plastic and it's going to deteriorate you. And the other thing is, not only do you just have the chemical thing going on, but you're also slamming into these things at you know, 18,000 miles an hour. So the atomic oxygen environment tends to degrade things up there. It, it tends to erode them and damage them. And uh, if you think about it, this thing is always flying so that one side of it is constantly getting blasted with this atomic oxygen, and the other side is kind of like in the shade. You know, it's, it's, it's in the wake stream, the slipstream, if you will. And it's, the effect is much, much less damaging. So when I got onto this project, one thing they told me is, hey, when you pick this thing up, make sure when it's sitting in the payload bay of the shuttle, you're, you're going to be flying with the payload bay doors open because you have to have the doors open because you have to have the radiators to cool the shuttle. Okay, so you're going to be flying with the doors open. Make sure you don't point the space shuttle so that we get atomic oxygen on the, on the back side of this thing. It's pristine. You know, you'll mess up all our calculations if you do that. I said, okay, well, we can, we can do that. And I you know, coordinated with the guys who, uh, we call them pointers, they uh, manage the shuttle attitude as it, as it flies. And uh, the thing is, and this is, here's where you come in, Peter. We had to do, uh, you know, water dumps because this was for, before space station. And, uh, you know, the orbiter uh, electrical power generation system, the, the fuel cells were constantly making water. And we'd fill up the wastewater tank and we'd have to dump it. Well, okay, that's normal operations. But now here's the thing. How do you dump that thing? It's got a nozzle. It's got a nozzle on the port side of the vehicle underneath the cabin there. And it, and it shoots out to the side. Well, that's the thrust. Yeah, when, 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 it, when it comes shooting out, it flash freezes into ice. And you have this beautiful little ice show coming out of the side of the vehicle. And, but that's normal operations. Well, the thing is, that, that plume of ice going out, you don't want to run into that stuff. You don't want it to hit the shuttle. So here's where the orbital mechanics comes in. Um, if, you've got, if you've got something flying around the Earth, all right, and you increase the velocity, all right, let's say you've got a nice circular orbit going. If you increase the velocity and make it go faster, what it does is it flies out into this elliptical orbit, and the, the apogee of this orbit will be on the opposite side of the, of the Earth, this is the Earth, from where you burned, and then you'll come back down. Okay. And if you think about, uh, if you, if you uh, slow something down, it'll do just the opposite. The orbit will drop down, the perigee will be on the opposite side of the Earth, and it'll come back up. So uh, one way to think about it is it would be really convenient if you made sure that you pointed that nozzle either straight ahead or straight behind. Now the problem is, uh, if you point it straight ahead, Eventually, this stuff, every orbit will come back down a little lower and a little lower and a little lower. And eventually, you'll be in the same orbit you are. And that's not good because you'll end up running through your own uh, ice crystals. If you go the other way, then every orbit will go a little lower and a little lower and a little lower. And eventually, it'll spiral into the Earth and just become part of the Earth's atmosphere, which is fine. You won't run into it. So ideally, you want to point that nozzle straight back. Now, there's one other, you know, there are, there's other cases where you point it up and down. Those don't work so well. The one you really want to avoid is pointing it straight out to the side. Because what happens then is it still is in a circular orbit. It's still in the same orbit you are. But now the plane of the orbit has changed. Uh, and if you, if you look at it from the top, okay, uh, this is your orbit. 
all right? And if, if, if you do a plane change, you're now in a new orbit that goes like this, okay? So the shuttle stays in the same orbit, same exact parameter, same altitude, still circular orbit, and you've got these ice crystals that come around, and every orbit, they whack you in the side. So you really don't want to throw things away to the side because they'll half an orbit later, they'll come back and hit you on this side, and then they'll, anything that misses you goes out, and a half an orbit later, it hits you from the other side. And this just keeps going on and on and on until one of you either gets higher or lower, and you start missing each other. So ideal situations, always throw it backwards. Worst case possible is throw it to one side or the other. So we've got this water dump. And uh, what we want to do is we want to point the nozzle uh, on the space shuttle back behind us. But we've got the payload doors open, which means, you know, if we're flying payload bay forward, the open payload doors are in the back, and it's in the slipstream, and there's no atomic oxygen getting on that LDF in the payload bay. But now, once we kind of point that nozzle to the side, now the wind's kind of blowing over our back, and it's hitting one side of the LDF. So we had to do this kind of fancy contortion where we, uh, we designed a series of maneuvers where you'd go from belly forward to uh, kind of leaning with one wing up and one wing down. You had to be very careful when you went around so that you, you, as you maneuvered, you never put the payload bay towards the way you were going. All right, so we went and we designed this elaborate attitude. And that's where the orbital mechanics came in. And, uh, um, and that's also, uh, you know, we talked a lot about jettisoning trash. And again, if you've got to throw something away, like a big object like Clay was talking about last night, you throw it away behind you. And so that's where the orbital mechanics comes in. Yeah, that was, that was a great uh, explanation of, of uh, yeah, if, um, when, you, when you change velocity direction, you either go lower or higher depending, depending on that. So. And don't you, when you throw it toward a gravity well, like Earth, Sun, whatever, um, and you like increase it moving forward, won't throw it or throw it down, won't it hit you going back up? One. Yeah, that's a little more complicated because now you've changed the orbit, period. Okay. So it does, if you throw it straight down, you know, if you, if you focus your coordinate system, uh, maybe I better do it this way. See, this is, we've, we've focused the coordinates on the Earth. Yeah. Now, if you just look at, um, and I'll just draw, I'm a terrible artist. <laughs> we'll, we'll draw a shuttle here, all right? All right. If you, and, and let's, let's assume, just for sake of argument, that the shuttle is going this way. All right, nose forward, just, just to have some directions on here. If you throw it back, it's going to do this. All right, if you throw it forward, it's going to do this. Actually, uh, more like that. All right, but it's going to stay that way. If you throw it straight down, it does something like that. It comes back and hits you from overhead. But not exactly, because this, it really matters what this, the period of this orbit is. And this, this orbit will not have the same period, the same duration as this circular orbit. So you're, you're less likely to get hit. If you go sideways, then the period is the same and you, you will have a close approach every orbit. So uh, this, is be this is best, this is second best. Straight up or straight down is third and it's starting to get a little ginchy. Straight to the side is, no, no. Worse. <laughs> and, and, and that's one assuming thing that, you're flying shield down on Earth right, from yeah. those perspectives. And, and that's one thing that, that where sci-fi movies kind of get this wrong is that they, they might show someone like leaving leaving a station and they just kind of, you know, it's zero gravity, so I can just go over here and then uh, do whatever I'm doing over here and that stays the same. But, but just by adding that little velocity to get over here, you shift the orbital mechanics and it might just be a little bit, but but it starts adding up orbit over orbit. And, and so if you, if you kind of go sideways, the, that other vehicle might start going up or away. Or, um, and I guess I'm off the camera, so people on camera can't see me. <laughs> but, but, but That's yeah, how it, bad it, it goes away. Is. Yeah. <laughs> you go right off camera. Yeah, you go right <laughs> off camera. The so. things that make sense in gravity don't make sense in orbit. And, yeah. And, and this and gets was, even worse when you're trying to go the other way, when you're trying to rendezvous with something. Because now, when you're trying to get rid of something, all you care about is that it goes away from you. You don't care how fast or how far. You know, as long as it goes far enough away, fast enough, you're happy. When you're trying to rendezvous, 
it's got to get right there at right the, at, right. at the exact spot in time. And you don't want, when you finally get there, you want your velocity to be, relative velocity between the two objects to be close to zero. Because yeah. if it ain't zero, something's going to run into something. Yeah. And, and, and what that kind of looks like is uh, what shuttle has to do every mission is um, when shuttle um, goes into orbit, they actually, um, most of the time they go, the, the very first um, couple of orbits they do is, is what's called an elliptical orbit, where it's slightly like this, they got a low, uh, the lowest point in the orbit is called a perigee, and then uh, the highest point in the orbit is pat apogee, and then stations up flying higher in a, in a fairly circular orbit. Um, and so what they do is, is um, they might launch, and it, the, the shuttle might be here, but stations kind of over here, and what they got to do is time things just right, and what you, what you want to do is um, give a thruster firing so that if, if shuttle was to leave here, and, and it wants to meet station at almost the exact same point, and then once you get almost really close to each other, then shuttle fires its engines to go into this same orbit. And uh, one thing they they had an issue with on on the Gemini missions it is it's, it's kind of counterintuitive um, it, it, trying to do a rendezvous. So some so they had a um, in some of the Gemini missions what they did is they launched a target vehicle called uh, as I think the Agena. Mm -hmm. um, so if if both these are in an orbit, you've got the Agena target and you've got your uh, Gemini capsule here. Um, so let's pretend that this, uh, they're flying in the same orbit and they're just a little bit apart. Well, if, if you're flying in here is a little bit apart, what do you, what do you want to do here? You want to just say, oh, this is straight ahead of me. I'll just give it a little bit of gas and I'll just float right up to it. it when you give it a little bit of gas, you start going into a higher orbit. And instead of going this way, you start going up this way and you miss it. Or if, if you're approaching it, and worse, yeah. because you're in a higher orbit, now it takes you longer to, to do an orbit. You right. might have started at 90 minutes going around, you speed up a little bit, your orbit gets bigger, more energy, but then but now this it takes actually starts getting farther minutes. away. So in order, to, in order to catch up to it, you've actually got to go into a, you got to come down in your orbit, and, and this isn't indicated with the thrust firing, but you want to go down to a low orbit catch up, get maybe a little bit ahead of it, and then kind of go back into the higher orbit and, and do that. So, so you speed it's up very counterintuitive yeah. is the, the how all that works. You speed up to slow down, and you slow down to speed up. Yeah. So uh, how difficult is it to make those calculations? Is it pretty routine now? And I think it, it, those become. calculations are routine. But I mean, if, if you're an astronaut just trying to fly by the seat of your pants. You ain't going to do that. Yeah. 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 The it's, calculations uh, running through paper to tell the thrusters to do specific things are different than the astronaut using the joystick that he's so used to being a, a pilot in an atmosphere. Well, yeah. The, yeah. I'll tell you how it works is we'll, we'll uh, We'll plan out this whole rendezvous in little pieces where you keep coming a little closer and a little closer and a little closer. And every time you get to one of those, uh, one of those little checkpoints, you'll take a reading and figure out how far away it is, how much higher it is, and all that, and how much the different speeds are. And then you'll do a quick calculation, which the computers are wonderful at doing now. You basically uh, it takes you longer to type in all the numbers than it does for the computer to do the calculation, and it'll tell you. You now have to uh, uh, burn, you have to increase your velocity two foot per second in this direction. You also want to burn uh, four tenths of a foot per second in that direction. And so now you can have uh, your, um, your various sensors on board the shuttle that tell you how fast you're going. And you can just bump the thruster controller a few times and you can watch it count down. You can start two, 1.8, 1.6, 1.4. Zero, you know, you can zero it out. And, and that's the technique they use. And sometimes it's all programmed, for a larger burn, they'll program it in, it'll all be automatic and the thrusters will just fire. For a little burn, when you're starting to get close, you'll just bump the thruster a few, the controller a few times. Like the deorbit burn is all automatic. Yeah, yeah, that's a big yeah. one. Okay. Yeah, because if I you mean, screw it up, you'll just skip off the atmosphere. 
Well, I mean, like uh, for a mission like a Hubble mission where you start up at 320 miles, which is way up there for shuttle, uh, and you come down, that'll be like a 400 foot per second burn. That's huge. Yeah. It takes forever to, I mean, and, and that's one thing I really noticed uh, working those, uh, the, sh the Hubble flights. A typical deorbit burn, you know, takes, you know, three, four minutes, five minutes maybe. For Hubble, it was like eight minutes. It's like you're just burning and burning and burning and burning because you've got a long way down to come. And, and you're sweating while that, that's going because yeah. if that burn isn't just right, you, then you start getting some issues yeah. as far as you come in too shallow, too steep. Yeah. And that's where you get into my area right now with reentry <laughs> as far as I started flying with that. And some of the astronauts talked about it for their Hubble mission, servicing mission, like, they like almost want to tap on the gauges to make sure they're right, yeah. saying yeah. because the ohms uh, fuel level was so low to having to reach that high of an orbit. Right. Yeah. I, I know. To me, sitting in the control center, and I mean, I wasn't even the the guy in charge of rendezvous. I'm I'm just you know I'm a payloads guy, so I'm just kind of along, you know, just watching my gauges, making sure nothing unusual is going on. And my system is pretty benign at this point, and it seemed really weird to me, just it, it, just how long it was taking, how out of family or how unusual or how strange it was compared to the other flights. Yeah, yeah, being, that's one thing about the, these operations is, um, yeah, and I guess we're about to leave here in a minute because they're, they're gathering a lecture hall for those who want to get that cool shuttle toy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, in, in operations, you kind of get a sense of, you know, things go right and, and you, you get into that consistency and when something goes wrong, you got this subconscious, or, or if something is out of family, I should say, yeah. You have this subconscious feel about that once you've been working these systems for a while. Are, are we sure this is right? Are we sure yeah. this is right? And yeah, that like nagging feeling just doesn't go away. You yeah. drive your car every day and you get a feel for it, and then right, yeah, you know your car. You know, it doesn't feel this right today. Or, or yeah. On the skipping off the atmosphere thing, has that ever happened? I know it's never happened not on, on a man, man flight. Man no. Yeah, I know that for flight. sure. I mean, it's, but have they? Has anything man that was supposed to have re-entered? Actually, not re-entered, but I don't know. I I, I wouldn't okay. know offhand. Yeah. Now, for Constellation, they actually were planning to do a kind of a skip maneuver, yeah. not necessarily yeah. bounce off, but actually go into the atmosphere a little bit. And and, and this comes down to the orbital mechanics a little bit. Is um, is it's all about plane changes. It, so you go into orbit and uh, you launch from. Uh, 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 KSC, so if this is the equator, you're in, in a roughly, depending on, on which direction you launch to, you can always go, uh, Kennedy Space Center is at 28 and a half degrees, you can always launch to a higher inclination, but you can't go lower. Uh, so th so let's say you launch from, from uh, Kennedy Space Station at 28 and a half degrees, uh, so you're in, in this, this is your plane here, and it, uh, so this angle is 28 and a half. Well, so, say we launch a shuttle in the 28 and a half degrees, um, and, um, and, and this is part of maybe what came uh, also was with the um, Columbia uh, issue. Uh, Columbia, I believe, was at 28 and a half degrees for that mission? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and the space station is in orbit, but it's at um, 50, um, 51.6. It takes a huge amount of energy up in space to shift this. Um, and um, more energy than I believe so, fits into yeah. the general tank. Yeah. So yeah. one one nice thing that you can do with a skip maneuver is you can do a plane change by using the atmosphere a, a, as working. So uh, I believe to get more cross range on on the vehicle, they could come in and kind of dip through the atmosphere and, and perform um, and basically then kind of skip over to another location there. Um, but yeah, if if they had realized um, something was wrong with Columbia on orbit, there was no way that they could have, say, gone to the space station yeah. or something like that. It's just. Is it, does everyone here know why the space station is at fifty one point six? Yes, so that the Russians can launch from Baikonur, the Cosmodrome, and still be able to reach the station. Right. Because whatever your latitude is, yeah, because the Russians the are up here on here. You can go to. Yeah, ideally, you want to be. At the, the equator, because the, the, the nice thing is, is the shuttle can launch a lot more payload the 28.5 uh, than the 51.6. Because um, if you look at the Earth and it and it's spinning, well, um, 
you're spinning around a lot faster um, out at the very edge of the equator uh, than, than up here, and you get on liftoff, you get this speed boost. So if you launch from the equator, you get the most amount of speed boost, whereas if you launch at Florida, you get a little bit of speed boost, and, or, or a medium amount, and if, you, and if you're the poor Russians up here, <laughs> you, don't get much. you don't get much of a, of a speed boost up there. And that's yeah. why we always launch uh, from, from uh, west to east instead of east to west. I mean, there are other factors, like you wouldn't want to launch over uh, you know, the United States, but you know, why couldn't you launch out of California and go, go west? Well, it's because oh, you yeah. wouldn't go anywhere near as, as high with the same amount of energy. We're not being evicted. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> it's over. You've had all weekend. And if you want to win, if we're you want to chase her at like, 5.30, so we can... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess... Thank you, everyone, for joining I mean, is it possible? What's that? Can you want to ask some questions? I'll tell you what. I have a resume handy, would you? Yeah, it's got my contact on stuff on there. I think someone's not having my phone with me. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, 